Government's Justice Center, and I'll be the moderator for today's event. Before turning to the webinar and its feature speakers, I'd like to briefly talk through a couple of house cleaning items about how the webinar is going to work. Anytime during this webinar, you can ask a question by typing it into the Q&A panel on the bottom right-hand portion of your screen. We will keep a running list of the content-related questions that we receive, and then ask the panelists to respond to the questions during the last segment of the webinar. We'll do our best to get through as many questions as possible. If you encounter technical or audio problems during this webinar, please call WebEx technical support at 1-866-229-3239. Please understand that there are some technical issues you may not be able to resolve. For this reason, we are recording this event and we'll post it on our website. We should have the webinar posted online early next week, and once it's been posted, we will email you a link to the recording. Next, I would like to um, slide, please. During this um, overview, uh, very happy that we have um, BJA on the line as well as CSR, and we'll start off by welcoming and offering our congratulations to all of the FY16 SCA cohort grantees. Uh, we'll spend some time next talking about the National Reentry Resource Center and the resources available there. Then we'll move into post-award grant management and federal compliance, and then we'll leave time at the end for any questions and answers. Slide. Today's speakers, uh, we have Deanna Hoskins, Senior Policy Advisor um, of Corrections at BGA, Linda Hill Franklin, Jennifer L. Lewis, Zafra Stork, and Tracy Willis. Joining me at the Council of State Government's Justice Center is Stefan Labuglio, Division Director of Corrections and Reentry. And we also are joined by Sines Morena Rivera at, the, um, at CSR. She's a Senior Criminal Justice Research Associate. Awesome. Next. I will turn it over to Deanna Hoskins. Deanna? We may be having some technical difficulties. I'm not sure if Deanna is able to hear us right now, but Again, congratulations to all the Adult Second Chance Act awardees. As you all know, it's a very competitive process. And uh, we're happy to announce that there are eight smart supervision uh, grant awards made this uh, particular cohort year, uh, six technology career grant grantees, five uh, grantees serving adults with co-occurring um, disorders returning to the community, six smart reentry grantees, five mentoring, and four uh, working on statewide recidivism reduction implementation. Next. I'm not sure if Deanna's able to hear me yet. Okay. So at BGA, the mission um, is to provide Leadership and services in grant administration and criminal justice policy development to support local, state, and tribal justice strategies to achieve, uh, to achieve safer communities. Next. BJ will be um, very involved throughout the process of your grant program, um, and there are a number of expectations that all grantees should be aware of. Um, in your proposal, you've proposed a certain number of people that you uh, intend to serve, and, they, and the expectations that you would uh, serve the exact number of people or more. Uh, the expectation is also that you would use validated risk and needs assessment instruments, and that you would choose the most appropriate evidence-based practices and interventions to serve your target population. And lastly, the expectation is that you would seek help when help is needed and that you would communicate regularly with your TA providers at the National Reentry Resource Center um, and BJA staff. Next. What you all can expect from us is ongoing and timely support 
not only from BJA, but also the National Reentry Resource Center. Next, I'll turn it over to Dr. Labubula to talk about the National Reentry Resource Center. Uh, good afternoon. Um, this is Stefan Labulio, and so pleased to be with you this morning. Uh, the National Reentry Resource Center uh, is privileged to serve as your partner in making your grants as successful as possible. Whether you are embarked on a journey to do a statewide reform of your correctional system or you are looking to develop a great co-occurring program in one jurisdiction, we are there to help. The National Reentry Resource Center is a project of the Council of State Governments Justice Center run in partnership and with full funding from the Bureau of Justice Assistance. Uh, we are part of the bundle of services that are provided when you receive your grantee. Think of us as your technical consultant. Think of us as your reference librarian. Think of us as uh, an entity that is generating knowledge and uh, figuring out what knowledge can apply to your program. Uh, your success is our primary goal. Uh, we want to work with you to, so that you accomplish your goals. We also want to make sure that we are uh, providing you with lessons from the field. The NRC has been in operation since 2009. It was funded through the Second Chance Act of 2007, signed by President Bush in 2008. This is a landmark piece of bipartisan legislation that has allowed $500 million to flow into the, the field. At the National Reentry Resource Center, our focus is on delivering individualized technical assistance. We will work with you on your proposals. Uh, what is exciting to us is that over the last almost 10 years, the federal government, through the Bureau of Justice Assistance, has put $500 million into reentry programs, and we have learned a lot. We've been privileged to be providing support to over 700 grantees during this period of time. Additionally, in our work, we advance reentry re by training, uh, uh, by providing distance learning, uh, by bringing together uh, practitioners and policymakers uh, and, and individuals directly impacted by the justice system at uh, convenings. We provide a one-stop place for web-based resources that can assist you accomplish your goals. And, and finally, we are looking to develop evidence-based practices and piloting those in the field. Next. So a little bit about our website. If you haven't visited already, the, uh, the, the link is uh, provided in your materials. Uh, this slide shows that uh, a way to subscribe to a newsletter that is emailed to over 13,000 subscribers uh, each month. And our goal is to provide timely resources to let the field know what is happening in reentry, uh, both with uh, highlights of existing projects going on, new resources, webinars, and, and news updates. Next. As part of our services, we provide information with regard to what webinars and videos are being offered in the field, not just those that are run through the National Reentry Center, but those run through other resource centers funded by the federal government and others that are provided by other uh, nonprofit organizations and, uh, and community groups. Next. Think of our website as your online library, both with webinars and distance learning events, as Nicole mentioned. This itself will be recorded and will be part of our library. We have the latest and greatest publications that are available that speak about the challenges of reentry and best practices. Why we are so excited about working with you in particular is that you represent some of the best practices in reentry that we have learned over the last eight years. Uh, in reading your proposals, we see advancements that we have made in our field, and we are committed to seeing you achieve those goals and then taking those lessons and applying it to the larger field as well. Next slide. We are always trying to learn from our grantees. Uh, as mentioned before, over 700 
grantees have received funds from the Second Chance Act since 2009. There is incredible work being done. Um, prior to joining the Justice Center, I worked in two large jail systems for 20 years. I know the challenges that, that practitioners face, face, both working in institutions and working in the nonprofit sector. We have advanced our field significantly, and our goal through our website is really to highlight who is doing some great work with ideas that can be translated to uh, other jurisdictions. Next slide. Thank you, Stefan. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit more about the role of the NRSC TA provider. Um, and it's, you can think about it in three different buckets. We're there to help uh, you all achieve the goals of your grant, recommend, and that comes in a variety of uh, resources. You'll learn more about that during your grant specific, I mean, your grant program specific introduction webinar. Uh, but generally, we want to connect you to the best available resources, connect grantees to subject matter experts, as well as to one another. We also are moving towards uh, trying to make the field more data-driven and sharing with, the grant sharing with grantees evidence-based practices and promising approaches and providing support through monthly contacts, site visits, and distance learning opportunities. And we're also here to support BJA and their initiative, helping to ensure all of you are aware of the grant management performance measurement and other BJA requirements, and also provide BJA with timely information on your success stories and innovative work that you're conducting. Next. Great. Right. Um, in terms of our technical assistance timeline, uh, you should have heard by now from your technical assistance TA provider to set up your first call. And then later on this month in December, you will be receiving your planning and implementation guide that will help walk you through the planning process um, during the first year of your grant award. Next. Now we'll be turning it over to, uh, to BJA. Yes, hello. This is Zafra Stork. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. We were having some technical difficulties. I'm a BJA State Policy Advisor that works with Second Chance Act grantees, and I'm joined by my fellow SPAs, as we call ourselves. That's Linda Hill Franklin, Jennifer Lewis, myself, and Tracy Willis. We will often be your first line of communication. Next slide. Today we are going to provide you with a general overview of grant management tools, requirements, and regulations as they apply to your awards. We will cover the language we'll be using with you and how talk about how we can assist you and provide you with guidance to deliver good programs that comply with federal requirements. We're going to talk about award acceptance, special conditions, report submission, federal funding, accountability, and transparency act, FAFATA. We're going to talk about financial information, unallowable costs, grant payments, grant adjustment notices, GANs. You'll hear us talk lots about GANs, grant monitoring, your grant closeout process, and we're going to also provide you with a lot of additional information and resources, again, to help you implement good programs. Slide. One of the first steps that many of you have done was to accept your award. And in doing this, you assign a financial point of contact in GMS. You first make sure that you check your contact that's listed in GMS. This is really important because whoever you have listed in contact is who we as grant managers know who to contact. So if you have the wrong person, then you miss out on valuable information. 
<laughs> and you have to make sure that it's the appropriate email address and phone number. Again, we have lots of grants and lots of awards, so we need this information to be updated. You are to sign and date your award letter and initial the special conditions. We'll talk more on special conditions as we move forward. You're going to email your acceptance document. Again, most of you have already done this and you will in turn receive a packet that has your grant ID, your PIN number, and information about accessing payment in the GPRS system. Slide. This is what your award document looks like. Again, all of you have probably seen this. You signed it. You want your authorizing official to sign number 17. It, uh, this also shows why it's important to keep the right contact. The person who is listed as your authorizing official has to be the person that signs this document. Slide. Special conditions, and you're going to hear us as grant managers and spas talk to you a lot about your special conditions. These are terms and conditions of your award. All awards include standard special conditions. Some special conditions are program specific and certain special conditions may be added specifically to an individual award based on the review of the application and if award information is needed and was missing. Slide. The special conditions page is also listed and included in your award packet and this is vital that you read these special conditions and get to know what information is there and what your award requirements are that you will be held accountable to. So when you get your award document, you want to look at your special conditions and really familiar, familiarize yourself with all the conditions and requirements of your award. Slide. Some examples of special conditions are all, all awards have standard special conditions concerning compliance. Compliance with the DOGA Grant Financial Guide. This is a wonderful resource. You're going to hear us talk a lot about your, the financial guide and the information in it. This is um, a resource that helps you implement your award so that it's in line with the federal regulations and requirements. Um, they also deal with the special conditions, also deal with the use of federal funds, what's allowable, what's not, um, audit requirements, the Anti-Lobbying Act, civil rights, the Equal Employment Opportunity Plan that you have to develop, and reporting fraud, waste, and abuse. There are special conditions that deal with withholding funds for overdue reports or pending budget approval and other program requirements. When we're reviewing the award, if documents are missing, then you would often have a withholding special condition until that document is provided or the information that's needed is provided and the detail required. Next slide. Some examples of withholding special conditions are related to planning. Some Second Chance Act awards include withholding special conditions that limit your spending until required planning documents are submitted and approved, including the Planning and Implementation Guide, which you will work with your NRRC coach, and the Special Second Chance Act Action Plan. And these are important because it gives you time to actually plan your program, and it limits spending to be related to that planning. Also, we have withholding special conditions related to travel. The FY16 Second Chance Act grantees have a withholding special condition if their budget hasn't been approved that will allow them to incur obligations for travel, such as lodging and per diem and the amount not to exceed 15000 And this is for the sole purpose, purpose of attending required award-related conferences and training. However, it's important that you have 
If you have other withholding special conditions, that you work with your state policy advisor to get the information needed to remove those. Because if those are active, you still would not be able to draw down the funds even for required conference or training travel. Slide. Now I'm going to pass on the rest of the presentation to discuss reporting with my coworker and colleague, Linda Hill Franklin. Hello, my name is Linda Hill Franklin and I'm a state policy advisor at BJA for the Northeastern region. I will cover Second Chance Act reporting requirements and how to access awarded grant funds. You will be submitting reports in the Grants Management System, or GMS, and the Performance Metrics Tool website, or PMT, to document program activities, progress toward goals, and outcome. It is important to submit all reports on time in order for your project to remain in compliance with Second Chance Act program requirements. The GMS will automatically place a hold on grant funds if you are overdue with filing a financial status report or a progress report. Once the overdue report is submitted, the GMS will automatically release the hold. Your state policy advisor will review your submitted report and may change requests and report back to you for revision through the GMS. A change requested report will not result in a hold being placed on grant funds. Next. Financial status reports must be submitted in the GMS each quarter by your financial point of contact. After accepting the grant award, financial status reports must be submitted even if your agency has not drawn down funds. For questions about the submission of financial status reports, please contact OCFO Customer Service. Next. Listed are important reminders about submitting financial status reports. Ensure that your agency has a sound accounting system in place that allows you to report actual expenditures for all project-specific activities and track program costs separate from other agency costs. It is important to know which costs are allowable under the grant. All expenses must be reasonable and necessary to the project. If you have a question about whether a cost is allowed, consult the DOJ grant financial guide and uniform guidance or contact your BJA state policy advisor. Next. The PMT system and the GMS system are standalone systems, meaning data does not automatically transfer from one system to the other. Performance metric data will be submitted quarterly in the PMT. After completing the PMT report, save a copy of the report to your computer. You will need to upload a copy of the PMT report as an attachment in the GMS system as part of the required progress report. If you require assistance with the PMT reporting module, contact the PMT help desk. Next. Progress reports are submitted in the GMS and reviewed by your BJA state policy advisor. If a revision is needed, the GMS will automatically generate an email to the point of contact listed in the GMS. Ensure that your agency's point of contact information is up to date in the GMS at all times and check the GMS often for important communications from BJA. Next. If your agency receives $25,000 or more and subaward $25,000 or more, reporting is required in the FAFATA sub-award reporting system. Assistance with submitting the report is available 
through user guides, FAQs, and online demos at fsrs.gov. Next. The Federal Awardee Performance and Integrity Information System is an information system that contains specific information on the integrity and performance of covered federal agency contractors and grantees. OJP grants and cooperative agreements must that exceed $500,000 include a condition that requires the recipient to report particular information on civil, criminal, and administrative proceedings connected with either its OJP award or other grant cooperative agreement or procurement contract in the federal, from the federal government. Next. Grant funds are accessed through the Grants Payment Request System. The GPRS is a web-based payment system that allows the financial point of contact for your grant award to make payment requests. A GPRS user guide is available online, includes a frequently asked question section, provides information about how to set up a user profile, make payment requests, access your transaction history, as well as other helpful information. Next. Payment requests can be submitted at any time. However, if your account has a delinquent report, a hold will be placed on your account and you will not be able to submit a payment request. Once the outstanding report has been submitted, the hold will be removed from your account. You can request payment for an individual award using the Create Payment Request Form. The average time frame for a payment request to be processed and deposited is two to three business days. Please note that OJP does not process payment requests during the last four calendar days of each month. If, if a payment is requested during this time, it is not processed until the first of the next month. This concludes my section of the presentation, and I will now turn the presentation over to my colleague, Ms. Tracy Willis. Within BJA, and we're going to cover financial compliance and GANs. Okay, recipients agree to read and comply with the financial and administrative requirements set forth in the current edition of the DOJ Grant Financial Guide. Um, a lot of grantees either bookmark it on their computer and some actually print off the entire financial guide. It's your choice, but it is imperative that you become very familiar with the information that's in the guide. To be allowable under federal awards, grants must be reasonable, and necessary to the project. In addition, they must comply with funding statute requirements. Grantees need to refer to their program guides, award special conditions, and the approved budget. Next. OJP offers a grant financial management online training, and this is a 24-module training emphasizing the basics of federal grant management and is designed for those responsible for the financial administration of discretionary and or formula grant and can help avoid questioned or unreliable costs. This particular training is required for all PLCs and FPLCs within 120 days of award acceptance. To register, you can go to the website that's listed. The required training is also offered in an in-person classroom format and for more information, please log into the website that's listed. Next. These are some of the resources for financial information, the 2015 OJP Financial Guide, 
the Office of Management and Budget Uniform Guidance. And then OGT has a website that offers updates on FAQ, updates and FAQs on the uniform guidance. Next. The following are unallowable costs. Land acquisition, lobbying, fundraising, compensation and travel for federal employees, state and local taxes, bonuses or commissions, prohibited or controlled equipment, corporate formation, costs incurred outside the project period, entertainment and food and beverage, and then there are those program-specific unallowable costs. Next page. In addition to the unallowable costs in the DOJ 2015 Financial Guide, Second Chance Act funds may not be used for the following. Prizes, rewards, entertainment, tickets, or any type of monetary incentive, client stipends, gift cards, vehicles, and costs that do not support approved project activities. Next. As recipient or sub-recipient, you must conduct all procurement transactions in a manner providing full and open competition consistent with the procurement standards in the uniform guidance. This requirement holds whether procurement transactions are negotiated or competitively bid and without regard to dollar value. When determining whether an entity is a sub-recipient or a contractor, the legal document executed between the recipient and the entity receiving federal award funds from the recipient is not the driving determinant. The substance of the activity that has been contracted or subawarded will be the major factor considered. If you delegate program activities to another entity, that delegation would generally be considered a subaward. On the other hand, if you purchase or procure goods or services from another entity to carry out the project or program under a federal award, that activity will generally be considered a contract. Next. Monitoring subrecipients. The direct recipient is responsible for monitoring the subrecipient and making certain that all fiscal and programmatic responsibilities are fulfilled, including compliance with federal rules and regulations. There are three key components to monitoring subrecipients successfully. A subrecipient agreement that specifies tasks and reporting requirements as well as possible noncompliant penalties and termination procedures. A monitoring plan that is detailed in the subaward document and implemented by the direct recipient as planned. For subrecipients with federal expenditures over $750,000 annually, compliance with the audit requirements. Next. And this is a particular subject that we as grant managers and you as grantees will definitely um, be talking a lot about, and those are those grant adjustment notices. Again, it's used to request project changes and or corrections. Once OJP makes a decision regarding the proposed changes, the grantee is notified by, G, by GMS via email. And again, as my colleagues have stated before, it is imperative that you have a valid email address in GMS so that you can get your information in a timely manner. It is also important that you have more than one email address. So the FO, the authorized rep, the financial point of contact, and the program contact should be three different emails just in case someone misses an email. GANs are submitted and approved through GMS. GAN types include budget modifications, change of scope, project period, point of contact information, removal of special conditions, sole source, cost requiring prior approvals. GANs will not be approved if the grantee is delinquent on financial or programmatic reporting. And again, as stated before, if you are delinquent, either financial or programmatic, the system automatically freezes your funds. Next. Award recipients must verify their point of contact, their financial point of contact, and their authorized rep 
contact information in GMS, including telephone numbers and email addresses. If any information is incorrect or has changed, a GAN must be submitted to document the changes. Next, program GAN extension, project GAN extension. May not exceed 12 months past the original end date unless there are extraordinary circumstances. GANs to extend must be requested through GMS no later than 45 days prior to the current end date. Please include the following information in your GAN when you're requesting a project GAN extension. Your current unobligated balance, an explanation of why the project could not be finished before the current grant ends, Description of the pending activity to, to be completed during the extended time and how the grant funds will be utilized during the requested extended period. Next, change to project scope. Prior approval is needed when changes include altering programmatic activities, affecting the purpose of the project, changing the project site, changing target populations, changing the subgrantee slash contract. Work with your TA coach for assistance prior to requesting a scope change gain. Next, budget modification. Processing a GAN for a budget modification is like reviewing a totally new budget from scratch. You must attach a revised budget and revised budget narrative for the full award amount. Prior approval is needed when proposing the following changes. A budget adjustment affects a cost category that was not included in the original budget. Change to indirect cost. 10% rule is exceeded. And by 10% rule, I mean that the proposed cumulative change is greater than 10% of the total award amount, does not apply to an award of less than $100,000. For more information on budget modification requirements, refer to your DOJ grant financial guide. Next, sole source prior approval. Sole source procurement should be used only when use of competitive solicitation procedures like sealed bids or competitive proposals is not applicable to the requirement or is impractical. Non-federal entities may conduct non-competitive proposals by by procurement through solicitation from only one source when one or more of the following circumstances apply. The item or service is available only from a single source, the public exigency ex ex or emergency for the requirement will not permit a delay resulting from competitive solicitation, DOJ or the pass-through entity expressly authorizes non-competitive proposals in a response to a written request from the non-federal entity or after solicitation of a number of sources, competition is determined to be inadequate. Next. Sole source procurement. Prior approval through a sole source justification gain in GMS is needed for all sole source procurements in excess of $150,000. A document addressing each of the seven items detailed in the, is detailed in the DOJ financial guide. Approval of a grant award with a specific partner organization named in the proposal does not indicate approval of a sole source procurement. If a sole source procurement is submitted by using the justification that the item or service is only available from a single source, you must demonstrate how you came to that determination. A budget clearance does not mean that the submitted sole source justification was approved. You must submit also a GAN. You must submit also a GAN requesting approval. Next, publication plan submissions. All grantees and cooperative agreement recipients should begin submitting publications for review via GAN and GMS. The grantee should select program officer, program officer approval GAN and mark publication plan submission or other publication review and attach their publications into the GAN module. Publication, this applies to any major publications such as evaluations or final reports. Announcements, press release do not apply. The grantee should explain their publication plan in the GAN explanation box or in an attachment. 
This is in compliance with the BJA publication special condition to all awards. This concludes my portion of the presentation, and I hand it off to my colleague, Jennifer Lewis. Hello, everyone. I'm Jennifer Lewis. I'm the BJA State Policy Advisor for Second Chance West Region. I'll begin discussing BJA compliance monitoring. BJA will monitor grant recipients to ensure they are doing what was proposed and approved, <clears throat> meeting programmatic, administrative, and fiscal requirements, identifying and resolving problems and or issues, and receiving needed training and guidance. Next slide. Common audit findings. Below are the most common audit findings from DOJ awards from fiscal year 2010. These findings are provided to make recipients aware of some areas to monitor closely in managing an award. Accounting procedures are not documented or needs improvement. Internal control procedures are not document or needs improvement. Payroll procedures are not document or needs improvement. There is no documentation to support accounting transactions, journal entries, or costs. Inventory procedures are not documented or needs improvement. Next slide. Recipient staff is not adequately trained in general accepted accounting principles or government accounting responsibilities. Cash has been drawn in excess of amounts needed for immediate disbursement. Financial or other program reporting requirements are not filed accurately or in a timely manner. The federal financial report amounts do not reconcile to the recipient's accounting system and subrecipient monitoring is not being conducted. Next slide, please. Grant closeout. We suggest that uh, recipients should start the closeout process as soon as the project is completed and all federal and matching funds, if applicable, have been spent. There are two types of closeouts. First is the standard closeout. This is submitted within 90 calendar days after the grant end date. All administrative, programmatic, and financial requirements have been met. And all expenses must be obligated by the last day of the project period. The second is the administrative closeout. On the 91st day after the grant end date, GMS will automatically freeze funds, initiate an administrative closeout, and notify the grantee. This is if the grantee is unwilling, noncompliant, or unable to complete closeout requirements. Next slide, please. Closeout notification. GMS will automatically notify the grantee 60 days prior to the grant end date, on the grant end date, and 30 days after the grant end date. Notifications will be sent to the point of contact, financial point of contact, and the authorizing official. So again, it's important to make sure that these contacts in GMS are up to date or submit a change of contact again in GMS if your contact has changed. Next slide. Closeout components. There are five main components for closeout. First is the final progress report. And this includes a final PMT report that must be attached in GMS. Court and criminal involvement data must be completed in the final PMT report. The second is final financial status report or SF-425. Third, special condition compliance. Fourth, financial reconciliation. And lastly, programmatic requirement certifications. Please contact your BJA State Policy Advisor if you're having any questions regarding these components. Uh, for, di for additional information, we provided our main contact number along with our website and a list of State Policy Advisors for the Program Office and FAQs about BJA funding. Next slide. Other important links that may be helpful is the BJA Grant Writing and Management Academy. This includes training modules for federal funding, strategic planning, and budgets. The grants.gov website link, 
advanced management system links and training tools along with the help desk numbers, and OJP online resources. This includes Grants 101 and Funding Resource Center, and OJP standard forms and instructions. Next slide. Some standard forms, these include indirect cost rate agreements, disclosure of lobbying activities, accounting system and financial capability questionnaire, and standard assurances. Next slide. This stage is uh, our contact information. In order to address individual questions regarding your specific award and stay within the time constraints, please email your questions to your state policy advisor directly. This concludes the BJA section of the presentation, and now I will turn it over to Vanessa from CSR. Thank you very much, and good afternoon. Um, this is Stephanie Rivera with the CSR Incorporated. I am the lead data analyst for the SCA program. A copy of the performance measures and other training materials are available online on the info and resources page in the PMT. Next slide, please. Overall, this presentation will help you understand the impact of SCA as they relate to BJA's mission, focus on data-driven activity, and the importance of collecting accurate data for reporting. Performance measures help capture information so we may provide feedback to grantees, capture information to provide transparency reports and answer data requests, and capture information to assist with grant management. Next slide, please. As Linda has already mentioned, there are four reporting periods. Two reporting periods are comprised of program performance measures, and two reporting periods are comprised of program performance measures as well as narrative questions. Also, please take note, uploads to GMS occur on July 30th and January 30th as well. Next, please. Lastly, for the PMT, reporting schedule, there are quarterly, semi-annual, and closeout requirements. For quarterly, grantees are required to enter data for program, program performance measures in the PMT every three months. Semi-annually, SDA grantees are required to answer the narrative questions for the previous six months of activity. And for closeout, grantees are required to answer the narrative questions from the previous month of activity since the last PMT report submission to the GMS. Next. When you log into the PMT, you will see multiple tabs, such as profile, which includes grantee contact information, which was retrieved from information entered into the GMS. If any changes are needed, please update your contact information in the GMS system and contact your state policy advisor. For information and resources, this tab includes the reporting schedule in addition to webinar training, BJA performance measurement news, and PMT resources, program performance reports, and other resources. Lastly, for federal awards, this screen provides a summary of your data entry and report status. This list includes all reporting periods. Thus, general award information includes data entry as previously mentioned and creating reports is also listed under this tab. After each submission of data for the reporting period, a report should be created. In addition, when your GMS report is due, you must create an aggregate GMS report to submit to your state policy advisor through the GMS system. Creating a report can be completed by going to the Reports tab. Next slide, please. SBA program. The second chance act of 2007, administered by BJA, was enacted to break the cycle of recidivism, improve public safety, and help state, local, and tribal government agencies and community organizations respond to the rising populations of formerly incarcerated individuals who return to their communities. There are five active SBA programs in the performance measurement tool. These include targeting offenders with co-occurring substance abuse and mental health programs, family-based prisoner substance abuse treatment programs, the adult mentoring program, adult offender reentry demonstration grant program, as well as technology career programs. Although all of the programs have different goals and objectives, all programs share and consist of identical questions. Next slide, please. 
Each SBA program has different goals and objectives, as I've already stated. As an example listed here are the Adult Offender Reentry Demonstration Goals and Objectives, which were established to indicate what, to what extent grant activities meet the following objectives. Provide evidence-based reentry services to offenders, use validated assessment instruments, implement a transition plan for offenders, provide treatment services, offer additional services, support offenders with case management, and to reduce recidivism. Next slide, please. Once again, all SCA programs have many of the same sections and questions. For general award information, in the beginning of a reporting period, you will be asked basic information regarding your award status, including grant activity. This section is intended to determine if you should continue to report in the PMT or if this is your last reporting period. If the grantee is still operational, then you would answer yes to this question and continue reporting on activities during the reporting period in the PMT. However, if it is your last reporting period, you will be asked to complete closeout questions in the court and criminal involvement section. The grantee is considered non-active, non-operational if the grantee has expended all their funds during the reporting period or has no more funds to spend during the reporting period. As you can see, the questions are comprised of persistent level services provided. This covers cognitive-based, mental health, substance abuse, employment, educational, and housing services questions. This also includes risk needs assessment as well. Please take note that grantees should only report for new participants during for that reporting period. The performance measures also include program characteristics, participants' race, ethnicity, and gender, successful completions as well as unsuccessful completions, as well as the court and criminal involvement, which grantees complete upon the closing of their grant. And lastly, this is followed by eight narrative questions. Next, please. So just some things to remember. Remember to read the question carefully, including the italics. Italics are definitions for the question. It will tell you how to interpret the question. Print out the questionnaire. Fill it out. It will save you time when you have to input your data into the PMT. And don't hesitate to contact the PMT help desk with any questions you may have. Next slide. Lastly, the GMS reporting occurs twice a year, January and July. The narrative questions are due twice a year. The first reporting period for SCA, fiscal year 2016 grant, started on October 1st, 2016. And the data entry on activities that occurred during the October and December 2016 reporting period will be open for reporting in the PMT on or around January 1st, 2017, and will be due January 30th, 2017. Next slide, please. This is just some information provided for the PMT website, as well as the PMT help desk contact information. This concludes my section of the presentation. Great. Well, thank you, everyone. We haven't uh, received any questions yet. I know we're coming down to the end of the of the webinar. If you have any questions, feel, please feel free to put them into the chat box in the bottom right hand corner of your screen. And I do want to remind you that you feel free to reach out to your technical assistance provider. Uh, they are competent and eager and willing to assist you. Um, there's no wrong door. If there's a question related to um, grant management or PMT, we'll definitely make sure that it's directed to the right person and vice versa. Um, many of you have asked about the webinar. These slides will be available at www.nationalreentryresourcecenter.org. After you exit the webinar, a brief survey will appear on your screen. By answering the questions in the survey, you'll be helping the Resource Center improve on the services that we offer. We'd greatly appreciate if you take a few minutes to complete the survey. We'll e also email you a link uh, recording to the presentation. So if you register for the webinar, which you've had, you'll also get this email link. And it will link you to the PDF of the PowerPoint slides. 
and you should get that early next week. Thank you all for joining us.